we should have uh, finished this before the break because I just realized there were only uh, two or three more slides, I guess. So, um, so we, but we discussed the model for the turbulent burning velocity in the corrugated flame rate regime where the flame is very, very thin compared with the, um, with the smallest turbulent eddies. Now, this is a model that's often used. Um, we said in that regime, ST is proportional to U prime. And so that would mean here ST, this shows ST as a function of, of U prime. Um, you know, this linear line, that, that's, actually, that's actually what we just derived, okay? ST is proportional to U prime. This is a model that's often used uh, where people say, well, ST is uh, pro U prime to the nth power. And N is, you know, something... It varies, and you see also, uh, so for large V prime, when you go to stronger turbulence, then it doesn't follow this linear line anymore. And secondly, also, um, I mean, it's, it also doesn't seem to be universal. I mean, it doesn't, seem, it doesn't seem that the turbulent burning velocity can be expressed by only one parameter, uh, you know, because it's here it's kind of all over the place. And so... Uh, that's where we enter then the uh, Damkerler's small scale regime, or what we call the thin reaction zones regime. So he, there, uh, you know, he thought of, of a different limit. He thought, uh, you know, if I look at the um, laminar flame, the SL, SL is just uh, the diffusivity divided by the chemical time scale uh, and the square root of that, right? And then he thought, okay. Um, for the turbulent flame now in the thin reaction zones regime, we said the flame structure stays exactly the same. So the chemical time scale also stays the same. So he uses the same, he said, I want to express the turbulent burning velocity with a similar thing, but the, the chemistry, the chemical time scale is the same. However, uh, the diffusivity is not the same because now in the preheat region, the turbulence really provides the mixing and, and not molecular mixing. So he just replaces, in this expression, he just replaces the molecular diffusivity by the turbulent uh, diffusivity. And the turbulent diffusivity, you can write it also here again as U prime times LT. And then um, you see here, this is, actually, uh, this is actually the turbulent Reynolds number. So uh, ST divided by SL is the square root here, basically, of the turbulent um, Reynolds number. And so... Um, well, that's, that's, what, um, that's what this shows. And so this model, that's interesting now, this model, uh, you see, does not only depend on U prime, it depends on two parameters, U prime and uh, a turbulent length scale. So that's that what makes it very different uh, from the other model. This here shows a um, model evaluated here from the DNS. So this is the flame length of a premixed flame, and of course, the faster it burns, the shorter the flame is. So the, uh, you see that if you go to the higher Reynolds number here, the length uh, of the flame decreases, um, which means that the flame speed has increased. So that's the flame length. Flame speed has increased, but, um, but we just saw that in that limit, the flame speed is proportional with square root to the square root of Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number, I mean, here in this particular case, it was done such that U prime is constant, but, but the, um, the width of the slot here of the nozzle is increased for higher Reynolds number, which means the, the length scales become larger, the integral length scale of the turbulence becomes larger, and that's what causes then the um, flame speed here to be faster. Um, so that's then, I mean, now I have um, two limits, the small scale limit and the large scale limit. Uh, Peter here has provided a, a relation here that, that includes both of these limits. So I can write this as function of the uh, Damkohler number and then I can take the limit for large and small Damkohler number and it turns out this is the limit if, if the Damkohler number goes to infinity. This is the limit if the Damkohler number goes to zero. This is exactly what we had on the previous slide. So this is a form 
of the um, equation that can be used for different, um, you know, th for different Karlovitz number throughout the regime. And then um, I can also write ST. I mean, here we were looking at ST over SL. You can, uh, you know, also write as you, I mean, it, here is just an expression for ST over U prime because it turns out then I can write this really here as function of the Dumkuller number. And by the way, here in this, in this expression, then you can take the limit. Dumkuller gets very large or very small. But um, um, uh, here, I mean, we can also compare this with the experiment. This then shows the uh, burning velocity as function of the Dumkuller number. Uh, the little points are individual measurements, and you see they're all over the place. Um, and then you can take, again, the conditional mean, and that gives you these bigger black spots. Uh, and then um, the solid line here, that is the model. And you see, you know, it's not so, not so bad. Um, uh, even though, I mean, you, you cannot capture, you know, this big scatter. But um, it's not so bad. The dashed line here, these other lines are different models, which we don't need to discuss now. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the um, uh, premixed turbulent uh, combustion flame physics uh, and the burning velocity. Okay, then we go on. Uh, that, I think, is, um, is, you know, was very important. It's very important to understand this. For non-premixed combustion, there's no similar discussion. I still have a little section here on uh, turbulent non premix combustion, which starts actually with, uh, with laminar flames. And um, it just looks at the flame length. And we will discuss more about um, non premix flames when we talk about modeling. But um, again, because we're a little bit behind, I want to go through this quickly, uh, because here the maybe the result is the most important. And the result also is quite uh, interesting in a way. So uh, we look at the flame length of laminar jet diffusion flames and then turbulent jet diffusion flames. And laminar jet diffusion flame is like a cigarette lighter, right? Oh, yeah, here's a, a picture, you know. That's a laminar uh, diffusion flame. Um, maybe I don't need to talk too much about this. This is interesting. Maybe it's a candle flame. The candle flame on a zero gravity is totally different. Um, it's very interesting because these uh, uh, microgravity flames, zero gravity flames, they... Um, they extinguish at some point by themselves because here for this thing, you always have, um, you know, you have buoyancy and then you draw air. You always fresh air. This thing here, you just have, there's no flow. It's just diffusion. So the, the oxygen diffuses here into the flame, but then there's no oxygen, you know, that's flowing from behind. And so you get less and less oxygen. At some point, this thing just goes out. <laughs> by itself. Uh, that's actually one of the strategies for firefighters. They just wait, um, you know, in space. Um, okay, what's interesting, so for this thing, um, for this uh, laminar diffusion flame, we can write the governing equation, continuity, momentum, and the mixer fraction equation. We can write these in a um, uh, cylindrical coordinate system, and then it's a 2D set of equations. And then uh, from the 2D set of equations, we know actually this has a similarity solution. We can derive a similarity solution. And again, I'm, I'm not going into details here. Actually, this the whole similarity solution, how to derive this, is shown here. But what it gives you at the end, it gives you the mixer fraction profile in space. Or here, the mixer fraction along the center line. And if we want to know the flame length now, we can just set, so it gives you the mixer fraction as function here. Let's see, of the Reynolds number, this zeta is just the, the z coordinate here. It's the distance from the nozzle, is, is zeta. D is the diameter here of the nozzle, and so on. So the, um, uh, so the mixer, so if we want to know the flame length, we can just set in this equation, this here, equal to stoichiometric, and then we see at what point does the, the mixture reach stoichiometric conditions? Because this ridge here is lean, and the flame length will be, you know, the flame will close exactly at stoichiometric conditions, because that's where the reaction zone is. So that's what we do here. We just set this, this here equal to Z stoichiometric, 
And then I solve this for this z, or here we call it l now, the flame length, and then you see this is what you get. And, and if I divide, so this has a u0 times d squared by nu. If I divide this by d, then I have l over d, non-dimensional uh, flame length, then you see that is proportional to the Reynolds number. Which means if I increase the Reynolds number, if I make the Reynolds number twice as large, the flame length will be twice as large, I mean, compared with, um, uh, uh, or non-dimensionalized with, with the nozzle diameter, okay? So, so that's something we can try out. So I have here my burner again. Uh, only this time I um, put here some tin foil on top. That sometimes uh, is a little messy, but let's hope it's not. I know what you hope, but uh, <laughs> I hope it's not. And then, you know, with a needle, I, point, I have a little hole here on the top so that we get a, a very small nozzle diameter so that uh, I can get a large Reynolds number, you know, with a large velocity with the same uh, flow rate. Okay, so let's turn this on. Now, see? That's what I said. It's always a little messy. So this time, at least, it started burning here in the beginning. I had this before, that there's a little hole here on the bottom. Gas comes out, and more and more gas, uh, you know, it starts you form, start to form a gas bubble here in the bottom, and then all of a sudden, there's a big explosion. So let's do this again. OK, so here's my laminar flame, and now I increase the Reynolds number, and, you know, the flame gets longer. OK? Very simple. Good. So that's, we showed that, OK? And now we were talking about turbulent flames. We want to do sim the same thing for turbulent flame. OK, so here, this, these are measurements for the flame length, and then this here is the laminar regime. This is the solution we had. We said flame length as function of Reynolds number is linear, and you see kind of, you know, that's what you get from these measurements. So now we want to look at this for the turbulent flames. And what's interesting is the equations for the turbulent flame, they look very similar. I mean, in fact, they're exactly the same, except here I have the laminar viscosity, uh, I mean the molecular viscosity, and here I have the turbulent viscosity. That's it. That's the only difference, right? Um, because we modeled uh, the turbulent transport, we modeled it, you know, like the molecular uh, transport. And so that's the only difference. You get here the um, turbulent and here's the laminar. Now, which means the solution will be exactly the same, only that in the solution we don't have the molecular viscosity, we have the turbulent viscosity. So this was the solution here for the, for the flame length, for the, uh, for the laminar case, and this for the turbulent case. And now I have here the turbulent viscosity and the turbulent viscosity divided by, um, so let's say, or the inverse turbulent viscosity, or U um, times, times D divided here by turbulent viscosity. And that's interesting because um, I can write this again as, so I have U, we just call it U, uh, U0. That's the, just the, the bulk velocity that comes out of the nozzle times d. That's the nozzle diameter divided by nu. Uh, t, and then I can write this again as u naught times d divided by um, u uh, t and um, lt. Right? That's what we did earlier. We said um, this here is just a turbulent velocity fluctuation. We call this u prime. U prime, I should have said. U prime times LT. And now what causes this U prime to be large or small is, is the bulk velocity. So if I increase the bulk velocity, I also increase the velocity fluctuations. Okay? And, and same here. If I increase the nozzle diameter, then I increase the, the scales of the turbulence. Right? I mean, if I make the diameter twice as large, the, the eddies will also be twice as large. So that's the interesting thing here. This here is basically a constant, you know, um, because the, they have the same, uh, this, this 
is linear and this is linear, so what comes out is just a constant. It turns out this is roughly equal to 70, okay, from experiments or whatever for a special case. Uh, so, this is a so here, this is a, the Reynolds number, but here it becomes independent of the Reynolds number. So this says um, the flame length now should become, as soon as you get a transition to turbulence, should be independent of the Reynolds number. So the only thing that controls the flame length then is the stoichiometric mixture fraction, uh, which appears here. You know, these are really all constants here, the density and so on, and the nozzle diameter, okay? It, it basically says, if I, for constant nozzle diameter, the Reynolds number doesn't matter, I always get the same flame length, but if I make the nozzle twice as large, I get the flame length is twice as large. Okay, so this means you can really control your flame lengths. We try this out now. So, first again, laminar flame. Increase the Reynolds number. It gets longer, longer, and when it can transition to turbulence, <laughs> I can't get this sealed here. Okay. Maybe I, I need to do it faster. But when it transitions to turbulence, I mean, you see, it doesn't change anymore. I can crank it up or down, and it doesn't change anymore. The only thing that happens is this. Um, okay, so maybe, maybe uh, it wasn't the greatest demonstration, but uh, actually it was good because, you know, this is uh, even more fun than if, the, if it really works well. But, but you saw, I, you know, I can change turbulence number. It doesn't change the length anymore. The flame lifts off even more. But, but even that doesn't change the length very much. Yeah. So that's interesting. And uh, again, uh, look at laminar and, and turbulent uh, flame length. Now, the, uh, the nice thing about this is that uh, here's a, this comes from an analytic solution. It's a very simple way for you to determine what the expected flame length is. I have used this uh, many times. I've used this uh, in, in court, uh, actually, you know, for, for uh, you know, a case where... Uh, there was a question about mixing. One of my students, uh, one of my, not students, uh, students who took my class recently came to me and said he's working on a, uh, on a problem now, and he said, I use this formula <laughs> to estimate the length of a, you know, a hydrogen league or something. But, um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a really powerful little uh, equation. And we can use it here to estimate how large would a, an aircraft engine be if it was laminar. And so here we say, let's say in an aircraft engine I would use a turbulent jet. And then I estimate how long is the turbulent jet. Uh, you know, I have here a dodecane is my fuel, and then you know, we make a few approximations. We say the nozzle is, is um, you know, half a centimeter, and then I get a flame length here, you know, doing this, of about half a meter, okay? And then we can do the same thing here for the laminar flame. Same formula, you know, just the one for the laminar. And you see you get 640 meters. Which means if there was no turbulent combustion, you couldn't fly, okay? We would still fly with a helium balloon or something. <laughs> we would, uh, I wouldn't be here. I would have come with a ship or, or so. Isn't that interesting? I mean, you know, this is a, I said it's a factor of 100. Uh, this is a factor of 1,000, uh, roughly. Okay, but I mean, you wouldn't use a laminar jet, you know, you might do it differently. But, but with laminar combustion, you cannot make a plane, a plane fly because the engine would be heavier than the, um, uh, you know, than the rest of the plane and it wouldn't fly. Okay, uh, that's, that's all for non premix combustion. And then we'll talk about uh, modeling. Okay, so model development, we have already developed model here for, for premix combustion, I mean at least for the, um, uh, for the determinant burning velocity. Um, here we want to talk about, um, you know, some simple models that you often find in, uh, in codes. Then we want to talk a little more about um, statistical methods. I mentioned um, PDF and so on. I mentioned this a few times. We'll define these things. Uh, most of you know what this is, 
uh, so we do this quickly. And we talk about a few models, and, and the list of models is not very comprehensive. Um, I think for us here, it's more important to understand the, the, the physics and the theory, and then you, you, know, you can figure out how this relates to the different models. And some of the models here, they're um, explained only because they are, you know, they're, um, they're a good example for how one uses, um, how one constructs a model uh, in, in a simple setting, not because they are, uh, you know, so widely used. Okay, so we start out here again with uh, equations. Um, we said we have a vector of scalars, mass, friction, and temperature. Uh, you know, this, and so we can write the equation like this. And then we said um, we can derive an average equation uh, which has an unclosed transport term, a uh, scalar flux term. We use the uh, gradient transport assumption, and then this is closed, and then the source term is not closed. And the first thing you could do is you could say, okay, um, you know, I, so what is this? I mean, this is why, remember this, this is why... Um, you know, let's just say it's one set global chemistry, then it is something like um, Y fuel times Y oxygen times exponential minus E divided by RT. And it's all of this average. And then, you know, some coefficient here in front of it. So what we saw earlier is that if I have um, a linear function, and I average it, then I can just evaluate it, um, you know, with a mean. That's, that's, ex that's exact, okay? That's what we saw. We derived the Reynolds equations. But if you have a nonlinear function and you average it, you know, it's not the same as evaluating with a mean. Still, you could say, okay, I could um, try now to um, maybe just evaluate all of this with the mean values, okay? That's the simplest approach I can think about. So, um, yeah, so this, this has some analysis that shows what the quantitatively a little bit what the error is, but I want to show you an example. So this here is the um, transport equation for, for uh, mass fractions, and uh, so we want to write this now for, for isotropic turbulence. Isotropic turbulence, all these terms are zero, and all that remains is this. And here the chemical source terms is one subglobal chemistry, is this, and there's a bar missing here on top. I mean, this should be average, but, um, but uh, so now we could say, okay, we want to um, here replace the, the, the averaging by the mean fuel, mean oxidizer, and mean temperature. And then this is an example I showed you earlier, the DNS for non premix combustion, and, um, and then you see here the mean temperature as function of time. And, and you see in the beginning, the mean temperature is very low, because everything's unburned, and while you know the reaction proceeds, that the mean temperature goes up until at the end everything is burned, fully burned, and then the temperature is very high. So that's what you see here. The symbols um, they actually no the dot the, the solid line shows the DNS data, and then we could use a simple flamelet model, simple uh, flamelet table. And we'll, we'll look later a steady flamelet model. We look later at you know how this looks like, and that gives us this. But if I replace in this um, expression, I replace here in this expression, I just replace um, the averaging here by just everything uh, evaluated with the mean quantities. I get this. Okay, the, te the temperature will never go up. Okay, so th uh, the point being uh, that's totally wrong. So we need to have some modeling and. Um, well, first thing we could do is we could use a commercial code. And so here the commercial code has a few uh, models. This is fluent, could be any other code. This is also, you know, let's say quite old. I probably copied this here uh, many years ago. And so maybe this looks differently now. But, you know, I have here species model, and it says here species transport. And then, you know, I can uh, click here on different turbulence chemistry interaction models. Laminar finite rate chemistry, that's what we just did, and, and we saw it wasn't very good. And then uh, there are other models here, like an eddy dissipation model, eddy dissipation concept, eddy, uh, here also finite rate eddy dissipation, and so on. And we just want to look at some of these, some 
uh, you know, historical models that have been developed a long time ago, uh, which are still, you know, often used somehow. And, and one is here, there's um, any breakup model by Spalding, uh, which actually, you know, was then a prototype for, for other models that are very similar. So here, I mean, they are saying the same thing. Spalding is saying the same thing. Uh, we, I mean, he was interested in internal, comp I mean, uh, spark ignition engines. So that's, that's why he developed this model. And um, so it's a model for premixed combustion. And the idea here, again, is that you have the turbulence. The turbulence just creates flame surface. And that flame surface then, um, you know, it leads to faster burning. And so the assumption here is that you have, uh, after preheating, you have very fast chemistry. And the idea is that the breakup of eddies, they give you, you know, uh, smaller eddies and they increase the flame area and that gives you then um, uh, more combustion and, or faster combustion. And the duration of this uh, breakup then, it determines how fast combustion is. So that's why it's called the eddy breakup model. And so here the reaction rate is then just, I mean, what is the reaction rate? Has, inver has unit of inverse time scale. And here, I mean, it's just replaced by the turbulent time scale. It's just a mixing time scale. So epsilon over k, that's just the inverse of a chemical time scale. There's a, co a coefficient here in front of it. And then uh, there is here the, um, the variance of the product. And that has a meaning. I mean, that's maybe a little empirical. But the meaning is that um, if you're all the way in the unburned, you, you shouldn't have any reactions. Uh, but all the way in the unburned, the variance of the, of the product mass fraction is zero. And then if you are all the way in the burnt, also you shouldn't have any uh, reactions anymore because all the fuel is gone. But that's also, I mean, in the burnt, the temperature goes or the product goes to a constant value, the equilibrium value, so the variance there also is zero. And then somewhere in between, in the, you know, in the flame front, you have variance, and that's where the reaction then is non-zero. And that also includes then somehow the preheating, the preheat zone, because what happens then is you have an eddy that, or turbulent mixing that brings some hot product into the, into the cold region, and, you know, that starts the preheating and that starts the combustion. But that um, then what it does really is it increases and makes the... the the variance of the product in that region non-zero. So that's, that's kind of the preheating is also in, in, uh, captured by this. So that's a model that people have used. You typically, you need to adjust the constant, this uh, eddy breakup constant, you know, to an experiment, and then you can do uh, variations using that uh, constant. The problem is, you see this totally independent of the chemistry, which means uh, the model doesn't know if you have EGR, exhaust gas recirculation, or if you have a lean or rich mixture, the model doesn't know this. And so you cannot use it, for example, for diesel engines. And so uh, people who are more interested in diesel engines, here, Magnussen, they came up then with a, a sim very similar model, but that's made for diesel engines. So uh, in this model, they also say the chemical source term is proportional to a turbulent time scale or the inverse of a turbulent time scale. So, you know, faster the turbulence, faster the, um, uh, the reaction is. But then they say it's proportional to the minimum of these quantities. It's the minimum of the, of the reaction, uh, uh, of the reactants and the product. So what this means is if you have no oxygen, so this here is oxygen and, and fuel. So if you have no oxygen, then that would be the minimum of the three, then the reaction rate is zero, okay? Makes sense. If you have no fuel, also, uh, you know, then, then one of these terms is zero, then also the reaction rate is zero. Uh, also makes sense. And then third, uh, let's say before combustion, before ignition, auto ignition has taken place, you have fuel and you have oxygen, but still, uh, the reaction rate should be zero. And so um, that's what this does. So when you have no product, also you have no reaction, okay? So, but if you have a, uh, you know, kind of a after auto ignition, auto ignition then is taken care of with a different model within the ignition model. But then after auto ignition, you have locally some product in the reaction zone where then uh, this term becomes non-zero 
but it's governed then always by, um, you know, how much fuel and oxygen you have. Okay, so that's, that is uh, that model. It has now um, uh, actually two uh, parameters, A and B, and uh, these parameters also need to be adjusted to an experiment. Uh, if you have only one parameter, it's usually easy to, uh, to, to tune. If you have two parameters, it gets a little more complicated. But people who use this model, they know how to do it. And, um, the, you know, I mean, once you fit it, uh, you know, it works. But because it's a one-step global chemistry, it doesn't consider the fact that you have intermediates. And so usually the heat release is a little too fast. I mean, even if you get the, full to the same burning time, the heat release is a little too fast. Um, and then there is, um, yeah, I mean, this just shows what happens in the different regimes. That's basically what I just said. So summary here is uh, model is controlled by mixing, fast chemistry, and uh, it has some, it, um, uh, it, uh, it uh, yeah, a big advantage is very simple model and, and a very robust, and disadvantage, of course, uh, I mean, you have no, um, for example, everything that's not infinitely fast chemistry uh, cannot be captured. And then, uh, as I said, fuel consumption is usually a, bit, a little bit overestimated, and you get uh, temperatures which are a little too high. So these are just a few examples for models that you find uh, somewhere. So then, before talking about other models, I want to introduce some of these concepts um, uh, you know, probability, probability density function, and so on, before uh, moving on. And so, uh, this concept here, all of this is taken here by, uh, from this book here by Steve Pope, uh, Turbulent Flows, and if anyone is interested, it's a very good read, very um, uh, nice to read book, and so uh, one can um, find a lot more information in the book. So, in order to start um, talking about probability, we first need to introduce the sample space. I mean, the, the, and, and we need to, uh, you know, tr uh, try to see how can we measure probability. First of all, um, you know, I can, let's say, I measure a, I do a local measurement, uh, a measure of velocity, and I want to know what is the probability, you know, that... I measure a certain velocity. That, you know, these are things that we are usually interested in. So the first question is, what's the probability that, you know, I do a measurement here, that the velocity I measure is 5 meter per second? What's the probability is 5 meter per second? Probability is zero. Why? I do a measurement, and it will be 5.1, okay, or 4.9. It will not be 5. Or it will be 4.9999999. It will not be 5, uh, or 5.001, okay? So um, finding an exact value is impossible, uh, zero probability, okay? So we need to find a different way of defining probability. That's why we introduce the sample space and say, um, you know, the sample space, first of all, is um, the space with which I compare my experiment. So uh, that is the velocity space, let's say, I do an experiment five meter per second and I try to see, you know, where uh, in this space would I find it. So the way we define then an event, probability can be defined for an event, uh, and, and we can define an event as, be so if I have an event, for example, I do a coin toss, uh, heads or tails, uh, then heads is an event, tails is an event, and I can find the probability that I get heads or tails, right? And so here, I can define an event by saying the event is true if the velocity is not exactly a given value, but if it is less than a given value, okay? So I can think of the, um, you know, I can ask the question or reformulate the question I asked earlier rather than saying what is the probability that um, uh, the velocity is one meter per second? I could say what's the probability the velocity is less than one meter per second? Okay, and then sometimes I measure 0.5, and sometimes you measure 10, but then, you know, from all of these, each one gives me a true or false, and I can take the average of this, and that gives me then the probability. So that's how we want to define an event. And then um, we can, uh, as I said, we can define the probability of this event being true, okay? But for us, as always, 
you know, is, is the velocity or the temperature less than a given value. So, and then um, I can define from this the cumulative distribution function by saying I, I'm interested in the question, is the velocity less than, not only is it less than 5 meter per second, I'm also interested in the question, is it less than 6 meter per second, 7 meter per second. I'm actually interested in the probability of all, for all uh, possible given velocities. And that, so then uh, the probability is, a, that probability is a function of the uh, velocity I compare with, and that's what we call then the cumulative distribution function. So the cumulative distribution function gives you the probability that the velocity is less than v, where v now is, is a variable. Okay, I determined this for all possible v. And that's shown here. So this is the probability that the velocity is less than, than you know, this given value. And of course, you know, if I look at um, minus infinity, what's the probability that the velocity is less than minus infinity? It's zero, right? And what is the probability that the velocity is less than plus infinity? Is one. Right? Cannot be larger than plus infinity. And so in between somewhere, this function goes from zero to one. You know, where I get most of the measurements, that's where, uh, you know, this, this um, function then changes the most. So these properties, they're important. Um, I mentioned this. U smaller than infinity is impossible, means f of minus infinity is zero. Uh, this is certain, so it's one. And then f is a non-decreasing function. It cannot be smaller, right? I mean, the probability that the um, velocity is smaller than 10 can never be less than the probability that it's smaller than 5, right? I mean, if it's smaller than 5, it's also smaller than 10, you know, so it's at least the same or it must be larger. So it's a monotonically increasing function. And from this, then, we can define the probability density function. I mean, if I look at this function here, um, I kind of know most of the samples, most of my experiments, they appear in the region here where this function changes very strongly, right? I mean, if in fact, if all measurements were, velocity is exactly zero, then this would always be zero, and exactly at zero it would jump to one, and then be one, right? So, um, so that's why, I mean, you know, I get most samples where this function changes strong, most strongly, so we define the probability density function as just the, the slope of this, of this function or the derivative with respect to this sample space variable, okay? So df dv. That's the PDF, and then, you know, this is how it looks like. This here is a Gauss um, uh, PDF or normal distribution, and then we can also get for the PDF, we get certain properties, you know, which derive here from the same thing. Um, so, uh, because the CDF is a non-decreasing function, the uh, PDF, which is the slope, must be always larger or equal to zero. Okay, that's clear. And then, um, what's interesting also is this must satisfy a normalization condition, because if I integrate this, from, from minus to plus infinity. So if I integrate f of v from minus infinity to plus infinity, then this is equal to f of v, the cumulative distribution function between 0 and 1, right? And f of, f of 1 is what, f of, sorry, between of minus infinity and infinity, right? And the cumulative distribution function at infinity is one, at minus infinity is zero. So that means um, in order to satisfy these conditions, uh, this integral you know, must be equal to one, okay? This is equal to one. That's very important, if you ever you know, work on a PDF, you have data, you want to uh, do PDFs. Sometimes we do this with binning, you know, we uh, don't forget to normalize the function. Uh, I had a student once who was working on, on you know, she uh, was, was um, trying to determine a PDF, 
uh, for a long time, and always the result was wrong, and ultimately it turned out uh, it was just the normalization was forgotten. Never forget the normalization. It's very important. This is not a PDF if it doesn't satisfy this condition. Okay, so... Um, um, right, and so uh, if f is minus infinity, it must be zero. Plus infinity also must be zero. Okay, so that means then if I have, if I have the... Um, the, the cumulative distribution function, interesting property here. If I want to know the probability that the, that the value is between VA and VB, here it's just the, the difference. It would be F of this, uh, this value minus this value. That's the probability that it's in between these two uh, values. Now for the, for the PDF, the probability that... Um, you find the measurement between these two values is just um, integral between these two values, okay? So the area under the curve of the PDF always gives you the probability to, uh, you know, to be in these points. So that's why the integral of the PDF also is very important. And again, uh, you know, this goes back to the normalization condition. If I integrate this, you know, over all space, then the probability must be equal to one that I'm, you know, that I'm, that that a value is between minus and plus infinity. So we can look at different uh, distribution functions, uh, spe special distribution function. This is the normal distribution, the, the Gauss distribution. You, you've all know, seen this. This used to be you know, when I was a student. Uh, we had here the ten mark, ten German mark bill. Here was uh, Mr. Gauss, and it had actually this function here plotted, printed, and also the formula. So you didn't need to memorize this for the math exam. You know, you just have to have money, uh, which for students is also sometimes uh, difficult. But uh, <laughs> anyways, um, the, the, so this normal distribution, why it's called normal distribution, because in nature you see this very often. There's uh, something called the central limits theorem that says if, if I have a random process, you know, has some distribution, doesn't really matter. And you have uh, another random process, and they interact. And I have a, a large number of random processes which interact, then the result will all, always be um, a normal distribution. So the normal distribution in nature, uh, you observe it very, very often. Uh, the other one that's here for us is important is the so-called delta um, function distribution. The delta function really means there's only one value as possible. Okay, so if, I, if only one value is possible, then every single sample will be the same value. And um, it's just like a Gauss distribution, but the width of the Gauss distribution goes to zero. And so uh, that's a delta function. Basically, in the cumulative distribution function, this will be a jump. And um, you can also say, okay, and there's not only one value possible, there are multiple discrete values possible. And then you get a uh, here multi-delta function, or for example, a double delta function that will be important for us later on. Because um, so, for example, if you think of a premixed flame and you measure the temperature, um, and let's say the, the the thickness of the flame we said is infinitely small, okay? Then what can I measure? I will either measure unburned temperature or burned temperature. There's nothing else, okay? So there will be. Um, a double delta function, which we draw this here with a little arrow, means really this goes to infinity. Um, and um, Right, because if this is a PDF, it means the area under the PDF must be equal to 1, right? But because the width of this is infinitely small, the height needs to be infinitely large, right? And um, so then the area, if I have a multiple delta functions, then the area that corresponds to each needs to be distributed in the probability that, uh, according to the probability that you get, these are these, um, uh, here this p and 1 minus p um, values, these are the probability to find one peak or the other. And then, so let's say we know the PDF, that's very nice, uh, then if you know the PDF, you can determine the mean, the variance, the kurtosis, the um, flatness, you can get all the higher moments of, of the PDF. And so um, uh, this is a property of the PDF. 
If you have the PDF and you want to know the nth moment u to the nth power mean, then this is how you determine it. And what's, what's even more interesting is if you want to know if you have a function that's only a function of, of your random variable, and you can also determine all the moments of that function in the same way. Yeah, just q to the nth power times the PDF integrated over all space, that gives you the nth moment. And that's something that we also uh, use very often. So an example here is, uh, you know, n equal to 1 would be just the mean. So the mean is just v times f of v dv integrated, uh, you know, over all space. That gives you the mean. Okay, so I can also, so these were PDFs of one variable, but I can also have multiple variables to look at joint distributions. And so, you know, there are a few more slides here on, on joint distributions, and um, maybe uh, we'll skip over these. Uh, but, so this is how the joint distribution is, the joint PDF is uh, defined. So I have a joint cumulative distribution function, and then, uh, you know, I just take the derivative in, terms, in both directions uh, according to both uh, variables that uh, describe here the joint distribution. And then um, also here you get the same properties to just no, now for uh, multiple functions. So this will be the joint this, um, statistics of uh, variables will be important for us also. When we, think, um, when we think of, um, you know, because we have um, multiple scalars in, you know, in combustion. So you might be interested in the joint statistics of temperature and um, uh, mixture fraction or, or something like this. So uh, here, the you know, same properties. If you have a joint uh, distribution of multiple variables, then also that must be larger than one. Uh, it also must satisfy normalization condition. Now, meaning if you integrate it in all directions over all of space, then also it must be equal to 1. And um, what's interesting, if I have the joint PDF of two variables, integrating over one variable gives me then the PDF of the other variable. We call that then the marginal PDF. So if you have joint statistics then the, uh, uh, of, of multiple variables, then the... Uh, PDF of one variable that's called the uh, marginal PDF. What's interesting also of the, um, we saw earlier the PDF of V, let's say that's a, that's a scalar value, but it's a one-dimensional function, a scalar value in one dimension, right? So, I mean, that's how we draw it. If we have joint statistics, then it's still a scalar value. This F function here, you know, it's 5 or 10 or 0.1. It's a scalar value. But it's a scalar value now in a two-dimensional space, okay? And in, in combustion, sometimes we have many, many variables. Maybe you have 50 species. Uh, then you have a joint distribution of all these 50 species together. And that is then a scalar value in a 50-dimensional space, okay? So that's, that becomes a very complex function. And now here also, this is the same as for the... For the um, um, uh, you know, as for the, just the PDF, here for the joint PDF, if I know, if I have a function uh, of, you know, all these variables, and I want to know the mean or the variance or any moment, I, if I know the joint PDF, I can always, uh, and I know the function, then I can always do this. And where is this important? Uh, let's say I had the joint PDF of fuel, oxygen, and temperature. Let's say I have this, okay? And I also know, here, I know the chemical source term in terms of um, fuel, oxygen, and temperature. So if I want to know this mean, then all I need to do is just, you know, take this times the PDF of YF, YO2, and y and temperature and integrate this and integrate this over uh, you know all of all of these variables sorry so this should be dyf dyo2 
and dt. Uh, sorry, it's a little uh, uh, cramped here. But this here then gives me the mean chemical sandstone. Right? So if I have the joint PDF, because I know this Q function, I can always write it down. You know, I can get the, so the, the PDF is all I need. The joint PDF basically is all I need. And one example here is just, you know, for what you can do here. Uh, so let's say this function Q should be here the, um, for the covariance uh, U minus U mean is U prime, right? So this is U1 prime and U2 prime. And then, you know, I integrate this over this PDF. That gives me the correlation function here between U1 and 2. And, you know, could look like this, whatever. Okay, and then, uh, so this is how this looks like. We said uh, the PDF is a scalar uh, function in now in two dimensions, uh, you know, if, if we assume this is two-dimensional. And uh, this is how this looks like. So let's say, you know, these are high values, uh, these are low values, and these are even lower values. So you get, you get um, you know, some distribution here. To, to D, and you see these have a correlation uh, in, I mean, for this specific example, they have a correlation be, because, uh, you know, I mean, you see uh, that, that values along this line, they would be a little more likely. Um, anyways, now, one interesting question that we often ask uh, in combustion is uh, about a conditional mean. And we had this several times where we said, what is the mean chemical source term? for a given value of the temperature, okay? So, so let's say I do many measurements, you know, I measure the chemical source, um, let's say in the DNS. At each point, I have the chemical source term and I have the temperature, and I want to say, okay, now let's say the temperature is equal to the inner layer temperature. What is the, chem the mean of the chemical source? Then I still get for the, for the inner layer temperature, I get many different, uh, you know, values for the chemical source term in the turbulent flow, and I want to take the mean of this. So that's what we call the conditional mean. And the conditional mean is determined here from this uh, so-called Bayes theorem. Um, so basically, I could say, if I so this is my two-dimensional PDF. I could just say, if I'm interested in the PDF of V2 for a given value of V1, you know, I can just extract it from this plot. I can just extract it from this function. If I take the, if I just take this function along this line, you know, this is how it looks like, right? Um, but that's not a PDF. Why is that not a PDF? It's not normalized, right? I mean, um, you see, if I would take it for this value of V1, then, you know, it would be very low and, um, you know, it definitely is not the same area under the curve. So what the Bayes theorem does is nothing else than taking this function along this line. And so this is this. This here, a value. So this is the conditional PDF of V2 for a given value of, of, of U1. Okay? So it just takes the PDF at that value, V1, and divides it here by this uh, marginal PDF because that is exactly the normalization. So the, so the Bayes theorem is nothing else than the, than the normalization condition. So, but that allows us, if I have the joint PDF here, and I know the, so I have the joint PDF, I can actually direct, directly determine the marginal PDF by integrating over V2, right? And then, you know, from this, I get the conditional PDF. Yeah, and so the normalization, you can check this out, is satisfied by this, and then I can get a conditional mean by integrating over the conditional PDF. And then the conditional PDF, um, of course, if U1 and U2, the two random variables, if they are statistically independent, then um, the the PDF of V2 is always the same, no matter at what uh, value of V1 I determine these. So, so then they become independent, and um, here the Bayes theorem actually then says, uh, the joint PDF is, or here I can say the joint PDF is the conditional PDF here, 
times the marginal PDF, and because the conditional PDF, if they, under, if they are independent, is equal to the marginal PDF, then the conditional, the joint PDF can be just written as, here the joint PDF can be just written as the product of the marginal PDFs, okay? If that's also, you know, something we often do. Why? Because, not because variables are not independent, um, because very often we don't know what the joint PDF is. And so we say, oh, well, let's just say it's equal, uh, let's say they, they are independent and then it's equal to the product of the marginal PDFs. Independent variables are uncorrelated. Uh, the opposite is not necessarily true. Okay, so then, um, are we out of time now? 5.30? Three minutes, what can I do in three minutes? Uh, so you see this transported PDF model uh, is, yeah, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about this, even though it's green, so, um, uh, you know, I want to skip this. Uh, so now we said, if you know the joint PDF of all scalars, then, you know, you can evaluate source terms and all of this. I mean, then you're done. I mean, that's, that's what we want to know. So, you, you, I mean, one way to think about this is to say, okay, why don't we just derive an equation then for the joint PDF? So, this is the um, uh, idea here of this uh, transported PDF model where you derive an equation for the joint PDF. The equation is a little complex. The big problem is that you see the PDF is, of course, a function of three dimensions in space. It varies from point to point, but it's also a function now of the random variables, right? And so here, the, the PDF is a, yeah, I mean, is, is, a three, is a function in a three-dimensional space and also in, maybe, let's say, a 50-dimensional species space, okay? So, so it's, you know, a function in 55 dimensions. And so, if you want to solve this equation like this, you see, you need to discretize also in this species space. So you need to discretize, not in 1D, 2D, 3D, you need to discretize in 50 dimensions. So that, of course, is not possible. I mean, it's very clear. So uh, people have come up. So this was uh, Steve Pope. He, you know, I mean, he and some others pioneered uh, these, these methods. And... Um, What's interesting about this is that you see here you have chemical source term and you have the, um, you have a mixing term. I mean, this is molecular mixing. And um, the, what's, well, you know what people sometimes say, what's nice about these models is that the, the chemical source term is closed. That's what we said earlier. If you, if you know the PDF, the chemical source term is closed. That's usually what we have to, I mean, the big problem. So here the chemical source term is closed, but because I know the statistics only at one point, I don't know the joint statistics of neighboring points. I know the, the statistics at one point. I also know the statistics at a different point, but I don't know the statistics together. Because of this, I cannot evaluate local gradients. That's a problem. So this here actually, these are local gradients here, uh, which, are, which are not given by this model. So this mixing term, it needs to be modeled, and the, you know there are many different uh, there are many different uh, models for this mixing term, and um, different flavors for you know when you have combustion uh, is a little difficult to formulate these models, but um, but at the same time um, one of the issues is remember when we talked about premixed flames we said um, the actually uh, the chemical source term, the chemistry the chemical time scale is influenced by mixing. Remember this? We said uh, chemical time, time scale is influenced by mixing so that these two effects, they always need to be treated together. They shouldn't be separated. In these models, they're separated because this here, you know, it's just, uh, it just comes from the definition of the source term and the PDF, and this is modeled independently of the, of the chemistry. That's, that's, you know, one issue. Uh, and, and as I said, the other issue is that there are, I mean, this is a very high dimensional space, you know, very expensive. At the same time, so people have um, developed, or here Steve Pope has developed these uh, models to uh, close this, uh, to, uh, to uh, solve this by, by using what's called notional particles. So rather than uh, solving a 
discretized equation like this, you replace the PDF by many particles which have properties that then locally allow you to determine the PDF. Each particle is one realization, let's say, and you have many, many of these, so that from that you can reconstruct the PDF locally. And then, you know, you just solve equations for these uh, ordinary differential equations than for these individual particles. And, um, and then always uh, determine the PDF. Okay, so, so we have used these models some time ago um, here with uh, Venkat Raman, and um, these are some, uh, some results we get from this. Okay, so maybe we'll stop here, and then tomorrow we start with uh, talking more about premixed uh, combustion than non-premixed combustion.